the beginning of this series of talks, I <clears throat> mentioned uh, when I was trying to outline what we would try and cover, I mentioned that I wanted to uh, explore a little bit uh, more about some of the philosophical questions involved in this whole endeavor and this whole opening up and exploration of soul making and particularly uh, questions of ontology and epistemology. And uh, just to refresh your memory, those words which I've been using a fair amount now and then over the last few years, um, ontology is, roughly speaking, the kind of philosophy that deals with or decides or tries to ascertain um, the reality status of different things. So what we count as real and what we count as unreal. And that investigation, or uh, in to state it a bit more in a bit more refined way, uh, ontology is the uh, philosophical discussion, if you like, of what kinds of reality uh, different things have. And epistem epistemology is the philosoph philosophical investigation discussion argument, um, whatever, of uh, r regarding how we know, how we know uh, what is real. So what qualifies as uh, knowledge? What qualifies as a mode of knowing, a way of knowing? Uh, what uh, qualifies as something that is knowable? And that's epistemology. And I think I said that in at the end of the first talk, which has now actually become two talks, um, Aspects of the Imaginal and Sensing the Soul, at the end of that, which is now, I would like to visit those questions a little bit of ontology, epistemology. And also, hopefully, later on in the last talk of this series. So I want to open that up now. Um, a little bit, because I think I think it's really, really important. Um, but uh, it's a huge subject, and I so I, I just want to open it up a little bit without letting the threads get too out of control at this point, or too sprawling, um, because they do have all kinds of implications and ways that they connect with all kinds of things. So for now, um, I want to open up a little bit of this territory, this philosophical territory, and questioning and rethinking regarding ontology and epistemology with respect to soul-making, sensing with soul, imaginal perception, and connect that with where I left off in the last part of this talk um, with the uh, observation that sensing with soul, whether it's intrapsychic, so-called intrapsychic images, or um, purely extra-psychic or a mixture of those uh, sensing with soul, woven into sensing with soul, woven into what we mean by imaginal perception, is a sense of, a sensing of values. Um, uh, so, for instance, uh, beauty, kinds of beauty, love, goodness, uh, nobility, Courage. These, um, the sense of that, either explicitly or implicitly, consciously or less consciously, is is woven into to the very sense of soulfulness that we have when we are sensing the soul, and also, uh, you know, a sense of the value of tradition, um, or a sense of the value of its kind of complement or opposite, if you like. Um, I don't know what we'd call that innovation, or perhaps even revolution. Um, humility, surrender, duty, these are um, values that we can sense not just in ourselves, in the, in the, in the uh, relational poise and stance with respect to what we are sensing with soul, but also in the object. So all kinds of values and all kinds of shades of different values are discerned, sensed, picked up on, attuned with, resonated with. Can we say that they are known? So that's where I want to tie this, uh, this, these questions of ontology and epistemology with this 
particular strand of the, the observation that sensing with soul includes sensing woven into it, uh, involves a sensing of values. And in our culture, more modern modern culture nowadays, um, I mean, one of the things that characterizes modern modern the modern sort of global world is is just how much differentiation there is and how much sort of plurality of cultures there are. But what we might call the dominant culture is characterized by um, a certain ontology and epistemology, and I would say a lot of um, confusion regarding epistemology uh, with respect to values, which I'll explain as as we go through this talk. And that affects or is related to the way it's, how difficult it is for us to kind of stake out or claim some uh, respect with regard to um, sensing the soul or imaginal perception and the reality of that or the possible reality or the reality status of that. <clears throat> so one would one can imagine no one objecting, saying, if you shared with almost anyone, I had an image and it was uh, really lovely and it really touched me, and the person would be either interested or not interested, or say, oh, that's nice, dear, or, or whatever. Uh, a few people would say, well, that's very dangerous, um, because you might go psychotic or you might dis lose touch with reality, etc. We've said all that before. But if you said, I had an uh, an image, or I sensed this tree, and I sensed that this tree loved me. I knew that this tree loved me. Then people, many people would object. You can't use the word no there. You are uh, making an epistemological claim that you have no warrant for. It's not the norm in our society. Um, so, you understand that... that um, when we try to open up and see how, how, what can we do with this question of ontology and epistemology with regard to the imaginal, um, we are confronted by a kind of contemporary cultural um, viewpoint that, that, that limits severely the knowledge claims, the epistemological claims, and the ontological claims of anything that we might sense when we sense with soul. So, I'm going to, hopefully, in the last talk, pick up on this uh, realm of, of values in, in the way that they are an element of, or a part of our sensing the soul, as I said, love, kinds of love, of beauty, kinds of goodness, nobility, that whole list uh, we gave. Um, and hopefully there I will offer some different pathways with all of this, and ways that the whole um, sensing the soul can actually kind of be navigated uh, in, in slightly different directions. Because sometimes it's possible when we are sensing something with soul, and say it's my, uh, say it's my beloved uh, other, uh, someone f with whom uh, there is a sense of the the erotic imaginal perception, and perhaps uh, we are holding hands, and uh, I am holding hands with her, with him, with them, and. In that touch, and perhaps in the sight, um, but let's say just in the touch, I can. Um, I am. I am sensing with soul. I'm perceiving, imagining with everything that that means, and within that kind of one strand of that sensing with soul at that time might be uh, her love. Let's say his love, that their love for me. And how do I know that? How am I picking that up? Um, it's, uh, I, I can say I know it. I know it through the touch. Um, are you going to, is someone going to convince me that I can't know that love, her, his, their love for me through the touch? 
Uh, love, as I said, is a, is a value. How am I picking it? I'm going to elaborate on this. Well, what about loveliness? Her, his, their loveliness. I'm, we are touching, we're holding hands, whatever it is. And within the whole kind of um, kaleidoscope and multidimensionality of the uh, perception, the, the total sensing that is going on when when we are in that um, erotic imaginal space together and the sensing the soul together. I sense uh, her, his, their loveliness. And this part of the sensing the soul and it's part of their particularities and my particularities and myself and all that. But there's a way possible of tuning in to just that element, just the loveliness. Now that is much more than just pleasant experience. It's a particular kind of pleasant experience. But if I go into it more, it's almost like I can... um, open up the, and focus on and open up the very essence of loveliness and the essence of a certain value, in this case, lo- loveliness. And it's sort of her, him, them, but it's sort of kind of a universal beyond. It's some kind of essence of, in this case, loveliness. Um, so it, it, it's almost like there's a whole other pathway that can be opened up um, when we sense with soul that I hope to return to later as a, as a sort of additional possibility perhaps in the last talk. But let's let's leave that for now. The main point is um, about, about uh, values and sensing the soul involves a sensing and can we say a knowing of values and what does that have to do with the ontology and the epistemology uh, and those kind of issues with regard to sensing the soul. So first, I hope a very brief uh, sort of um, history lesson or historical perspective. Um, Galileo, Galileo, Galilei, brilliant, uh, brilliant um, scientist, really, um, in Italy in the fifteenth century, sixteenth century. Um, believed that the world, he said, the, the, the book of the world, uh, reading, understanding the world, is reading a, a book written in the language of mathematics. And this was a sort of fundamental, almost religious principle that he held. And in that view, he decided to kind of pick up on and reinstate a view that was prominent in uh, one uh, uh, stream of ancient Greek philosophy uh, was called the atomistic view of Democritus and uh, I can't remember the other guy Lucretius was it um, and and so he said when when we deal with the world there are kind of primary qualities um, and he didn't actually use that word it was Locke that coined that word and so it, but it said, said something like there are primary qualities so for instance how heavy a thing is um, whether it's moving or at rest and how fast, um, at what time it's happening, um, where its location, its size, its shape, whether it's uh, this thing that I'm talking about or looking at or trying to investigate is a one thing or a collection of a few things or a collection of many, um, whether it's touching X or Y or not touching. Um, so all those are amenable to mathematical representation. They can be measured and given mathematical, uh, some kind of mathematical symbol or status. Whereas qualities like, he said, qualities like taste or sound or smell or color, these are, again, it's Locke's actual phrase, but Galileo uh, made the point originally, that uh, these are kind of secondary qualities. And he said, these are, these are more subjective qualities. There's something in the sensitivity of, of the uh, sensitive soul, sensitive organism, and they're subjective. They are not real. Only primary qualities are real. They are secondary qualities and secondary uh, qualities of a secondary status. Now, um, that idea 
en enormously brilliant idea and very, very fertile idea in, in terms of giving birth to the whole scientific revolution there. Um, picked up on by uh, Descartes, by Francis Bacon, by Locke and uh, Hume and others, and uh, gave birth to the whole notion of Cartesian dualism, actually, and there I'm following um, the writings of someone called Marcus Appleby, who uh, people often think that this Cartesian dualism, this is a little bit of a tangent, but I'll throw it in right now, the, the whole idea of mind and matter being separate and completely different things um, uh, w originated with Descartes, and but was... Uh, born in him or through him because of a kind of uh, idea of a transcendent God and that the mind, spirit, etc. was linked to that transcendent God. But actually, Descartes was much more secular in his thinking than, um, than say, someone like Thomas Aquinas who come before him who was much more influenced uh, by religious thinking, and had a much less dualistic philosophy regarding mind and matter. Um, so Descartes really kind of incarnated this, this what we call Cartesian dualism between mind and matter, and then the whole scientific method was born from Galileo with Descartes, Francis Bacon, etc., extended in the philosophies of Locke and Hume. Uh, and then uh, what, what, you've, what came with that gradually, over time, was this uh, kind of relegation, uh, a, whole, a whole ontology and epistemology, and a relegation of certain aspects of our experience, aspects of the world, into uh, what we might call, what were called secondary qualities, um, uh, meaning less real, and, uh, and then what we might even call tertiary qualities, even less real than that, for instance, values. And this took a long time. So the values um, with the scientific revolution and um, the so-called Western Enlightenment and modernism eventually um, became just regarded as uh, just historically conditioned opinions, really. What is beautiful? What is good? Uh, what is right or wrong? What is uh, the nature of love, etc.? Et um, what is one's duty, all of this. Uh, so there's a kind of hierarchy uh, re established over time, historically, in, in starting in Europe and then in, in the West and then, and then more globally, um, concerning what is real and therefore, as I touched on in an earlier talk, uh, what is respected and valued because it is more real or real as opposed to not real. Do you understand? Uh, this happened gradually and so the hierarchy of ontology and with it of epistemology and also of uh, respect and valuing and therefore also respect for different kinds of knowing or, or, or eventually this uh, kind of feeling that you, you're not justified to say you know X. You're justified to say you know this, but you're not justified to say you know that. And this spreads, actually, um, into all kinds of subcultures. The, the actual divisions of what is real and therefore what's worthy of respect and valuing um, uh, you know, that there's differences in different cultures. So, for example, in um, psychotherapeutic cultures, what's real and therefore what's uh, worthy of respect, slightly different and different among the different psychotherapeutic cultures, but also the, the uh, different, if we could call them, spiritual paths, um, whether they're um, so-called secular spiritual paths or so-called religious spiritual paths. All of them kind of bring in um, either implicitly, but more often explicitly, um, a certain ontology, a certain hierarchy of uh, reality or categorization of what is real, what is not real, what is more real, what is less real in some instances, and with that roll, roll out uh, um, a hierarchy of um, respect and value for things themselves and also for modes of knowing.
Or, so there's an ontological, epistemological, and a moral kind of hierarchy that's rolled out implicitly or explicitly with any kind of, uh, any kind of culture at all, really. Each one will say, this is real and therefore valuable, worthy of respect, and we respect the knowing of that real, that real thing or that real aspect. And that, but that, in contrast to this, that, whatever this and that are, is not real. So originally, uh, and and therefore we don't respect uh, and value it, and we don't respect and value the knowing of it. Uh, at least as much or not at all. So, originally, uh, what started as a kind of liberation from religious dogmatism uh, with the scientific revolution, with the Renaissance, and with the Western Enlightenment, what started as <coughs> liberation became gradually, over uh, several hundred years really, a kind of imprisonment of one form or another, that we are somehow told by whatever culture we move in, or cultures we move in, um, that, as I said, there is this hierarchy, this is real, and it's qu- this is real, this is less real, this is more worthy of respect, this is less worthy of respect. This kind of way, mode of knowing is uh, valuable and, and worthy of respect, and this is not, etc., um, and that can actually uh, become an imprisonment. So what started as a liberation in West, in in uh, in, in Europe, in the um, just after the Middle Ages, um, becomes in some ways an imprisonment for us. So I'm making. Uh, I want to make quite quite a few points here. They they sort of weave together. Um, I want to make a point. Uh, one point is what we value. Um, so um, this changes, as I said, with the dominant ontology and epistemology, um, and also uh, the. I want to make a point about the ontological and epistemological epistemological status of different values. Okay, so I hope I hope you can follow the different strands here. So where I'm going with this whole talk is um, if sensing with soul includes um, the sensing, the perceiving, and perhaps the knowing of values, and if historically the knowing of values is dismissed because it's not a primary quality, it's not even a secondary quality, it's something else, um, it doesn't conform to the epistemology of um, the, the sort of classical science and scientism, then uh, sensing with soul, because it involves sensing values and perhaps knowing values, the knowing uh, it, it, the knowing there, but well, we cannot claim any knowing there. It's, give, it's not given any place or platform, because values are not given any place and platform. So I want to make that point over the course of this talk, if you understand. And also, I just want more generally to point out the um, incredibly powerful influence of ideas in our psyche, in our um, uh, modes of discourse, modes of conceiving, ways of looking, uh, ways of relating, all of that, whole conception and sense of existence. So, in a way, actually, values can never be removed um, from our way of looking or conceptual frameworks and orientations. Actually, values that orient us. So, the scientific method, even, which in a way Galileo gave birth to and was developed more with Descartes and Bacon, um, is is in part an impl- implementation of certain values. So valuing this over that, valuing a certain mode of knowing 
a certain way of going about uh, um, establishing knowledge. So even though values themselves may be ontologically relegated, they always come in. Even to a system that says, uh, or implicitly um, devalues them, regulates their ontological status and their uh, epistemological status, they still come in to inform, to orient, to uh, direct that uh, system or culture. So more widely we need, I I would say, we need to recognize that different modes of being, different ways that we are in the world, different ways that we relate to the world, are governed, if you like, by different uh, hierarchies of values. So the mode of um, scientific uh, investigation, the scientific method, the mode of poetry, the mode of art, the mode of um, uh, p- politics and ec- economics, the mode of uh, the moral mode or the mode of navigating uh, m- uh, morally in our life, um, the mode of soul making, all these are different, if you like, um, modes of beings, and each one has uh, a different hierarchy of values appropriate to it. A different um, way of uh, organizing and and relating to uh, what is most important, what is considered, uh, and, and and also ontology and epistemology within that. To be, we we need to be careful not to be stuck in one. Um, uh, one mode of being's sort of value system or hierarchy. Um, when we're actually moving into another mode of being, another mode of relating to existence, to the universe. And because certain uh, value systems and hierarchies are kind of dominant in our culture, or kind of established over hundreds of years, through the education system, through the way people talk to each other, through the cultural agreement, it can actually be quite hard to recognize, now I'm in a different mode. And that value system, that hierarchy of um, values, that whole um, uh, ontology and epistemology and what goes with it, does not quite apply here. Um, uh, I'm in another field now, I'm in another domain, I'm in another mode of being. How do I decide between the, all these uh, um, hierarchies of values? How do, I, how do I decide and orient when I'm in different modes? And how do I prevent uh, undue... Uh, wh- how do I prevent one uh, dominant mode... Uh, dominant hierarchy, overextending its influence, spreading um, like like a kind of colonialism in into uh, areas that are that are actually beyond its reach, beyond its prerogative, beyond its purview, beyond its domain. So again, two points, I I know this might sound complicated, two two main threads here. One is about the influence of ideas, and I'll I'll come back to that in a second, just just to be really wary, and can we be really conscious of the influence of ideas? I know I've talked a lot, uh, uh, come back to this this strand a lot over the last few years. I think it's so significant for us as practitioners, and and just for us as human beings, at any time, whenever we lived, but certainly at this time, in in this point in history. So that's one uh, general point, the influence of ideas. And secondly, this idea that there's something about the way that values and a sensing of values are woven implicitly or explicitly into sensing with soul. That, uh, and, and the epistemological kind of confusion and quandary and relegation uh, with regard to values that we have uh, in, in, in our modern culture, generally speaking, in the dominant culture, uh, 
there's something about that epistemological confusion that relates to our hesitation or shyness or uh, non-permission with regard to the ontology and epistemology we might develop or claim with regard to sensing the soul. So with regard to um, to that little brief his- historical perspective that we could kind of trace that thread there going back to Galileo, this uh, developed and developed and kind of got more and more entrenched and more and more um, taken for granted, really, woven into the actual normal perception of human beings and how they uh, spoke to each other, the dominant discourse. Um, Unfortunately, for that for that whole perspective and the dominance of that whole hierarchy of values and, and perspectives, then came, just in, in the realm of physics, if we follow that thread from Galileo, then came Einstein uh, theories of, general, of special and general relativity and the quantum physics revolution in the early part of the 20th century, and uh, the first quarter, roughly quarter century of the 20th century. And... In those uh, discoveries of, of uh, relativity and quantum uh, mechanics, all of Galileo's primary qualities were rendered, uh, if you like, um, non-objective. His whole point was these are objective elements of reality. Everything else, taste and sound and smell, color, is subjective, and then later values even more uh, subjective, and therefore less real. But with the quantum revolution, and with the revolution in physics, with relativity and all that, um, all these primary qualities, mass, velocity, time, even the simultaneity of events, like what came first and after, um, location, uh, in space, in time, size, length, shape, uh, whether something is even one or a few or many, um, whether things are um, uh, part of one unit and touching or not, all these, um, all these so-called fundamentally, objectively real aspects of reality were uh, kind of exposed as being not objectively real, anywhere uh, near the, uh, the degree to which we thought they were. They were they, what the quantum and, and relative uh, quantum physics and relativity relativity physics revolutions um, exposed was just how much all these factors mass, velocity, time, location, size, shape, one or many uh, contingency, and all that were were dependent on the observer. Dependent on the observing. So that whole differentiation that Galileo and, and Locke made between uh, primary qualities and therefore more real and secondary, or even what we might call tertiary qualities, um, and therefore less real, that just dissolved. And the current state of physics, it's, it's uh, really hard to justify a belief uh, or, or the sustaining of that whole notion of, of that whole hierarchy and in a way what we realize is all of these things all of these elements of experience including value experiences um, all, all, all these uh, aspects of reality aspects of the world involve the subject involve the observation Participation is implicated in all of them. They do not have purely objective reality. So that whole hierarchy, that whole structure, that whole edifice, that whole tower crumbles. Um, Sometimes, if we, or or sometimes I get the sense uh, that, 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 it's possible to pick up on certain Dharma notions even and kind of um, 
construct a similar-ish kind of hierarchy. So the notions of bare attention, for instance, the notion that the Buddha ne- never used, um, but that whole notion, if I cling to it too tightly, too rigidly, believing, oh, this really is bare, this really is as it is, as things are, etc. Now I'm really being with things as they are. Um, or certain limited ideas related to that in, in relation to mindfulness. Um, again, not not what the Buddha taught, because the Buddha's mindfulness included: is there metta, is there not metta? What is of value, what is not of value? Um, even just pleasure and and pain, um, pleasant, unpleasant, etc. The Buddha did not have such a a, a pared down um, kind of uh, uh, lens, and then uh, a, a pared down ontology and ontological and epistemological structure. It's true that there was a certain uh, simplification and reductionism that he encouraged, but it wasn't that reduced. But uh, similarly, with the science influencing the wider culture, and um, in a way, uh, this whole Western Enlightenment um, and and modernistic and uh, scientistic um, influence coming in then uh, to so-called spiritual cultures and uh, kind of implementing implicit or explicit ontological and epistemological hierarchies there with ideas like bare attention, etc. The idea of what's real, what's not, what's more real, what's less real. The the sensations in the chest, the complexity of the emotion, the story, papancha, we tend, or can tend to um, uh, bring a uh, implicit value judgment about the uh, what's real and what's worthy of um, paying attention to, what's what counts as actual knowledge and just kind of um, fabrication in the negative sense. Now all that can get woven in um, to our Dharma practice um, in in ways that aren't fully questioned or elaborated enough, I feel, and then also into just obviously the way we live and how we relate to existence and how we relate to others and what we care about and what we invest in and what we stand up for. So these ideas um, influence reality notions of, of ontology and epistemology. Uh, ideas get a grip and shape our cultures. Plural. We move in different cultures these days. Ideas get a grip, and they shape the cultures we move in, and therefore shape our beliefs, our assumptions, etc., in a really fundamental way, uh, and particularly regarding um, our basic sense of reality, unreality, more or less real, ontology, and epistemology, and therefore what is of value, and all that's related. As I said, two points woven in together, what we value because of reality notions here, ontological and epistemological notions, and also the ontological and epistemological status of of values, like beauty or goodness or whatever it is, love. Two themes I want to weave together, I am weaving together here. Um, but ideas, the point right now is about ideas and just how influential they are and how important it is to kind of be aware of that so that we can get a little, uh, we're not just in uh, a kind of indoctrination there. So Jung very wisely um, wrote, uh, um, pointing out that at the time of the Renaissance, uh, some people use that word renaissance interchangeably with the Enlightenment and the scientific revolution, and other people point there were slightly three different movements going on there, but around that time, they all happened around the same time. Um, he, put, he goes on, the newly won rational and intellectual stability of the human mind 
Uh, nevertheless, despite the old uh, religious sort of uh, dog- dogmas, etc., managed to hold its own and to penetrate further into, into depths of na- nature that earlier ages had hardly suspected. But this is, this is uh, the point I want to make right now. He goes on to say, the more successful the penetration and advance of the new scientific spirit proved to be, the more the latter, the scientific spirit, as is usually the case with the victor, became the prisoner of the world it had conquered. The more successful the penetration and advance of the new scientific spirit, the more the latter, as is usually the case with the victor, became the prisoner of the world it had conquered. The more the scientific spirit became the prisoner of the world that it had conquered. In other words, as, as I said earlier, what was initially a liberation becomes, can so easily become, and has, I think, to a certain extent and in different ways, and it's quite complex, become a kind of prison for us. Prison of view, prison of assumption, and therefore prison of um, limitations on value and care in regard to the world. You know, we could also, uh, and from a certain perspective, we we could um, say that, uh, or we could see the scientific revolution as um, a kind of. Initially, it was in 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 soul making terms. We could see it as um, that initially, when it happened, there was a kind of shattering of the vessels. All it took, really, it took. A while for it to really take hold, uh, but there was initially a widening and deepening of the, you could say, the eros psyche logos dynamic of of the cult, cultural Weltanschauung of the, of the whole way the culture saw the world. Um, what was then attractive, the eros, the impetus of scientific penetration, investigation, and the widening of the embrace of science, and the image of uh, humanity in that endeavor and the image of what the world was and the psyche and the logos, the concept of uh, again what was real, what was not real, what a human being was and was not capable of, and what reality, um, uh, what what um, nature was and wasn't. Because it sought, you know, that there's the eros. It sought, after all, to know know things more widely and deeply to penetrate them, their nature, their working, and also the laws that govern their behavior. You know, laws are kind of another dimension, physical laws, I mean, whatever it is, uh, E equals MC squared, or Newton's laws of acceleration, or whatever, or uh, Maxwell's laws of electromagnetism. These laws are another dimension of the being of a thing, in a way. It's different, though in some sense it's similar to the kind of imaginal dimensions of a thing. If you like, we're talking about dimensionality now. And the way Psyche and Logos give or create and discover other dimensions in the soul-making process. We can also talk about the way physics discovers uh, and, and creates, discovers physical laws uh, that kind of pertain to things themselves, but they're another dimension of things. The laws that govern the movement of an electron kind of belong, or so to speak, are part of the electron, but they are kind of another dimension of the electron. So there is a kind of erotic movement, a movement of the imagination, a movement of the logos, a shattering, a widening, an opening of that initially. And then it's only in time that when there's a kind of shrinking down to the scientism. Remember, scientism means this kind of belief that everything can be reduced to science and reduced to a kind of physicalist, materialist, uh, usually atomistic explanation of uh, everything in the world, everything human and all the elements of being human, everything in nature. Um, so it's only with that shrinking down um, to scientism and physicalism um, of the sort of classical, when the classical science model shrinks down that way, that the, in our, if we look at it this way, that the um, eros psyche logos dynamic, the soul-making dynamic that we could say was part of the whole 
movement and shattering of the scientific revolution, the soul-making dynamic of the culture, it's only then, with the shrinking down and the rigidification, that it gets frozen, that dynamic. What happens, what would happen, or might, it, might there be a place now for keeping, keeping that scientific method open, as I said, as one of the modes of knowing, one of the modes of being and investigation, with its own hierarchy of sets of uh, values and ontology, epistemology and all that. And keeping that open and perhaps opening soul methods of knowing. Recognizing that these two can live together, can complement each other, and actually expanding both further. Maybe at this point in in um, our culture, more widely, maybe some kind of growing of the the sort of um, meta level ontology and epist- epistemology uh, to allow both those movements, the scientific method movement and the um, let's say the soul method movement, the soul method of knowing, to allow both those to expand and complement each other um, would be perhaps a step in unfreezing the uh, soul-making dynamic, the eurosychologos dynamic of the dominant culture. We could, could look at things like that. Ideas um, influence, uh, dominant ideas uh, that run through the culture, through the education, uh, through the way people think and talk. Uh, They influence and they constrain and they direct our existences, as I said, our movements and our, our, uh, our expressions of care. And, of course, they direct practice. As I've pointed out there, and and that shapes our perception further, or limits our perception, and the, the ways we practice psychologically, spiritually, etc. Um, being directed by certain ideas, then shape perception according to those ideas, and also um, shape value according to those ideas, and and the perceptions that get reinforced, or shaped, or directed, or um, circumscribed will also influence the values there. It's so um, prevalent um, in the larger culture and in um, whatever we might call psychological, spiritual cultures, subcultures. Uh, I read an article in The Guardian um, some years ago uh, by a guy called, um, I don't know who he is actually, Stephen Tompkins, and he just pointed out um, the Bible doesn't state anywhere that it should be read literally, Um, yet an all or nothing approach, I'm kind of quoting him now, yet an all or nothing approach is the core of many Christians' faith. I believe fully in that the world was created in seven days, the universe was created in seven days, and this and that, and Jesus literally, physically ascended to heaven or whatever. Um, and if I don't believe that, then the whole the whole show goes out the window. Um, so for many uh, Christians or Muslims or Jews, um, this kind of um, literalist approach is is really core to their faith. But the Bible itself doesn't say anything about being read literally. Biblical literalism, uh, he goes on to say, is by no means an essential Christian tenet. Okay, he's talking about Christianity now. We could easily apply it to other religions. Um, Biblical literalism is by no means an essential Christian tenet. No creed says anything about how to read the scriptures. The Bible is the word of God, Christians believe, but why should the fact it's God's word mean it has to be read with naive absolutism? In other words, why can't... It's God's word, you can say, okay, it's God's word, why can't we say God is a poet? Spirit is a poet. It was written by the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit speaks and writes more as a poet, more as an artist. 
Uh, and then, you know, he points out, and many of you will know, part of the problem is historical, that something happened with the, the Protestant um, Reformation. Uh, I don't think it was actually primary in what Luther intended, but the kind of, one of the things that, that he sort of favoured and that came out of that was a very literal interpretation of the Bible and a real limitation, a real tight circumscribing on the range of uh, how uh, scripture could be interpreted. It's a really um, kind of fundamental shift that happened there uh, and uh, part of the result of that was uh, religious fundamentalism. And that influences so much, so much, um, in the way one then sees existence and the whole hermeneutics interpretation of our existence, of our perception of existence. And and it does so even for um, those who are... um, That movement, uh, I think, uh, that literalism, that biblical literalism, affects, uh, influences not just those who we might call these days religious fundamentalists, it also affects um, uh, many other people who consider themselves religious and uh, the wider culture, even even sec- the secular secularists or people who consider themselves secular and non-religious. Something happened in the whole um, regarding of the ontological and epistemological status of what we what we call in our language sensing the soul and an imaginal perception, an imaginal reading of scripture, an imaginal reading of the the texts of reality, the text of existence, the text of body, of matter, of world, of others. Massively influential. Um, Disturbingly, uh, in this article, Stephen Tompkins uh, then pointed out, or it was a different article, uh, sorry, by someone called Harriet Sherwood, also in The Guardian, uh, quite some years later, um, and there was a survey or study, and I, I find this a little disturbing myself, but that just betrays my biases, but um, they found that um, uh, when a church uh, emphasized a literal interpretation of the Bible, that actually helped increase church attendance uh, and brought, uh, brought in a, a much younger congregation. So mu- many more people are attracted, it seems, by a literal, literalist interpretation of Scripture, and uh, for some people, young, for some reason, young, younger people are as well. So there's something here again. The larger point has to do with the ontology and epistemology of our endeavour of, uh, or our exploration of what we're calling imaginal perception and sensing the soul. And we're talking about large cultural ideas that really influence, limit, circumscribe, prohibit certain uh, and and relegate the status of um, certain uh, modes of knowing, modes of being, but also even more significantly modes of knowing, or what we might um, even uh, try to state, uh, to, to claim as modes of knowing. So this happens in all kinds of ways. There wasn't a Christian example, but we could give um, a more Buddhist example um, regarding uh, the way we see um, bodies, or our body. Now that, of course, is um, dependent on the way of looking, which uh, always includes a conceptual framework and the mind state. So when I use the word way of looking, you you know that it means a lot of different elements within that concept and also just what we call mind state or state of mind or mood or whatever. So I remember um, many years ago, I think it was almost almost 20 years ago, um, and I did a retreat um, completely on my own (coughs) in a cabin in the woods in... um, and when I was living in the States, and uh, I'd never done it, it was a really, really solitary retreat. I didn't take any books, any Dharma talks, no recordings, nothing, just me in the woods. I think I saw one person in the whole ten days, and um, uh, by accident. And um, uh, there was a, an intense heat wave during that time, and then it rained for two days straight, and I was just on my own, and... and 
um, in really total solitude. And at that time, my practice was the first time. I, I was some, something really happened in terms of my jhana practice. I I went really interested. So I had had a bit of an opening, uh, quite a significant opening before in terms of jhanas, and I I really sensed. Oh, I, I wonder what will happen. Uh, I really want to explore that. So I I went and um, the first four jhanas really began to open up, and I was really excited by that. Um, and I also had, in terms of if we speak about fantasy and image, I also had running through those, I think it was 10 days, um, a very sort of vague background, faint fantasy of being uh, a monk and actually filled out the fantasy. It was actually a Theravadan Buddhist monk. And that kind of um, sustained and gave some soulfulness to my days there and my explorations and my efforts uh, and my solitude. At that time, I had no um, uh, articulation or words or even interest in imaginal practice. I wouldn't even have... Um, th- I'd never heard of it, never heard of any any of this. Um, uh, and certainly hadn't hadn't thought about it and explored it the way we have now, um, but in hindsight, I could uh, tell, I could say that 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 was running through alongside everything. And I remember at some point there was a sort of um, large mirror, broken mirror that was um, outside the cabin, and I I remember uh, washing in in the sort of get water from a, a well nearby and and. Wash, washed outside my cabin, there was no one around, and just at some point catching sight of my naked body in this um, large broken mirror fragment. And um, it looked so strange. <laughs> my body looked so strange to me at that point. Um, something happened in the course of those days in regard to my my in because of the way I was practicing and because of the fantasy and because of the I'll explain this because of the practice practices I was doing something happened that influenced very much that shaped and colored very much my perception of in this case my body um I was also eating very very simply and not eating much at all and there was a real um uh kind of very surprisingly easy renunciation with regard to sense pleasure and all the rest of it that was very much helped by my uh, the opening up of the deep equanimity in, in, in the third and fourth jhana, etc. And, and um, so, so in regard to the senses and also in regard, particularly now I want to talk about body and materiality, um, I was... Again, I, I can only see this in hindsight, but what what struck me right then was just how strange my body looked. Um, the view uh, f- with with the jhanas there, um, the view of flesh um, is is kind of one of anatta. It's really just it, it goes very quickly to the sense of not me, not mine, um, and doesn't have implicit in that whole. A, in the fantasy, in the Theravadan monk fantasy that was operating there, and secondly, in the jhanas, um, doesn't, and the renunciation, etc., with regard to uh, eating and sense pleasure, all of that together, um, there was no sense of the body as anything sacred. No sense of this this body as something wondrous and sacred. If anything, it just looked a bit of a... Um, uh, a strange sort of uh, uh, animal, you know. I could see my animal nature, um, and and sort of almost as if a kind of an appendage. Um, it wasn't that there was hate or aversion, um, nor was there love. There wasn't any self-judgment of, oh, uh, you know, I wish I had bigger biceps or, or whatever. Um, uh, nor was there any aversion to the animal nature. But there wasn't either any sacredness or any particular interest or opening up of that of that um, sense of materiality. In the fourth jhana, in the first four jhanas, um, as you you might know from the Buddha's description, mindfulness saturates the bodily sense. Okay, so we're not talking about being disconnected from the the, the feeling of the body at all. Um, 
But it's a very particular kind of body sense, and with it comes a particular kind of body conception and view. With that particular practice, and with that whole kind of um, in c- complex of ideas and fantasy that goes with the, the Theravadan monk kind of thrust there, or the Theravadan thrust there in relation to body and flesh. So we have a, a colleague, insight meditation teacher colleague, and uh, I remember her referring to her body as um, a sack of meat or, or something like that. Um, and it wasn't that it was particularly aversive, but she was saying it because, well, it was... Uh, it, it's a kind of way of referring to it that is um, one of the strands that's very strong in the Theravadan lineage in which she was very firmly rooted, is very firmly rooted. And it, it wasn't there was aversion or hatred or anything, at least not, not obviously, um, but it's a certain way of regarding it, not sacred, not having this dimensionality, not as something that the eros can open up, as something uh, rather to, with regard to which we want to let go, see it a certain way uh, that leads to dispassion, um, lack of disinterest, um, etc. So, as I said, in the first four jhanas, the Buddha called them rupa jhanas, they're really um, body awareness jhanas, you know, primary, that's really um, the, the dominant experience, but um, but the body awareness undergo, in other words, the, the awareness is of the energy body, it's of that space, and then, then the different frequencies or textures of that space change, but it's not that we're out of the body or, uh, you know, it's disconnected in some way. Um, body uh, awareness is saturating and suffusing the body sense. Um, but there's no real interest or focus on the materiality of the body, and certainly not an opening up uh, of that sense. And, as I said, when there is, under sort of Theravadan insight um, rubric, it, it it's... It's hardly ever um, sacredness or wonder or a kind of erotic interest that is cultivated um, with regard to matter or body. It's more letting go, disinterest, um, a minimum of involvement, just enough to keep it um, uh, together so that you can uh, liberate yourself, um, uh, or regarding it as just the four elements uh, in a kind of reductive way. Let's not get too excited about this. It's just the four elements. Or it's kind of on its way to being a corpse. It's already a corpse, one imagines. Um, the body is dukkha, etc., etc. The point is, uh, here was a certain uh, fantasy and set of ideas that I had absorbed and I actually was was really helpful and really taken with. I was really taken with them. Um, borrowed from the uh, Pali Canon, Theravadan, Buddhist uh, logos and fantasy and set of teachings um, regarding body and materiality. And that, that massively influenced my body perception and conception um, at, at that time, vividly, immediately in the perception. And as I caught sight of myself in the mirror there, of my body in the mirror. Um, so regarding the body or materiality or anything else you know, say it so many times the way we see it, the way we experience it the way we feel it, the way we conceive it is always dependent on the larger conceptual framework Um, whether that's Pali Canon, Theravadan Buddhism whether it's Tantric Buddhism whether it's um, popular secular culture and we tend to regard the body in terms of self-judgment or certain body types are elevated or denigrated or this ego identification gets involved or if it's uh, the con- larger conceptual frame of the kind of cosmology of say uh, indigenous, indigenous Amazonian uh, person always that larger conceptual frame, the larger idea ideas influence. Uh, the larger idea 
set of ideas as well as the mind state in the moment and there's a huge range in that uh, as well as the feeling in the body and, and the image of the body and that image uh, overlaps with the conceptual frame with the idea idea and image overlap is something I want to come back to later in this set of talks so something like body materiality hugely influenced by all that and, and the point I want to make now is, is how much is influenced by idea how, how powerful ideas were and what are and, and what ideas are we absorbing from certainly from the wider dominant culture but also from the individual cultures and the, the subcultures if you like that we move in and are educated by and in. <coughs> 